Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Todd Clear. I'm the uh, interim uh, chancellor uh, of Rutgers University, Newark. Um, and it is my delightful honor to introduce our um, university professor, researcher, outstanding researcher award winner, uh, Ronald V. Clark. Um, this is a distinct honor because um, when, uh, when Ron was selected for this award, I was dean of the School of Criminal Justice, and I was going to be uh, sitting over in one of those chairs watching this. And uh, in the meantime, I got asked to, to uh, hold the fort down while we await our uh, incoming chancellor. And, and that meant that I not only had the chance to uh, enjoy this uh, talk, but, uh, but to tell you about Ron Clark. Um, so uh, there's a little fact sheet here, and I'm not going to do any of those facts. Um, I will say this. Um, there, uh, about five years ago, a book was published uh, of the 50 greatest thinkers in the history of criminology. Most of them are dead. Um, they go back to Cadillac uh, and so forth. And um, one of the names on that list is Ron Clark. Uh, our speaker tonight is a person who has been recognized by his peers as being one of the most important formative thinkers about criminology in the history of the field of criminology. Um, and I'm just delighted to be able to uh, introduce him to you. I also know Ron because I was a faculty member when he was dean of the School of Criminal Justice. I was a faculty member for about six years, uh, chair of the faculty for most of that time. And I had a chance to see what, um, uh, what extraordinary vision Ron has for shaping the conversation about criminology. Um, so there's lots of awards that he's won, lots of degrees he has achieved. He speaks uh, in, an, in, in a different country almost every month. Um, but really what's distinctive about Ron Clark is that um, he understands that criminology can operate in a different way in relation to its aims to understand what makes places safe. And he has invented ways of looking at that question that have dominated the research agenda of hundred, literally hundreds of scholars, uh, literally uh, many dozens of dissertations. And at the School of Criminal Justice became a person who uh, formed a way of thinking about criminology. That way of thinking, I won't go through all of it, but that way of thinking is dominated by the idea that you can understand what it takes to, for a crime to occur, and once you know that, you can make changes in places, environments, circumstances, that will make it so those crimes will stop. Um, that very simple idea has revolutionized the way people think about preventing crime. So for, so for most of history, people have thought the way you prevent crime is you try to find people who are about to commit crimes and you somehow persuade them not to. You either threaten to punish them or treat them or tell them that their childhoods were unfortunate or something. But Ron said, and, and his colleagues with him, that um, you can, a crime is really a situation that occurs. And if you look at that situation, you can bring a new kind of understanding of what you do about crime prevention. And this has been his seminal contribution. A few years ago, Ron became interested in what is perhaps one of the most pressing problems facing um, modern contemporary society, and that is the disappearance of species. Uh, and brought the, uh, the, the really profound ideas underlying environmental crime prevention, situational crime prevention, which was the school of thought that he has founded, to a field that all of us care deeply about, which is um, the protection of, of animals. Now that's an odd connection for a criminologist, and I think he'll explain a little bit about why he finds, finds it interesting. But the picture up in front of you is a, is a leopard. Um, they're rare to see. And if we are not mindful about our job as stewards of the earth, they will disappear. So Ron Clark is going to talk to you about his work, his orientation, but he's also going to talk to you about really what is, what is profoundly at stake, which is the opportunity we have in this generation to take the kind of steps we can take to ensure that future generations, our children, our grandchildren, and so on, will have a chance to see that animal sitting in a tree sometime in their lives. So it is my absolutely wonderful pleasure to introduce a colleague, uh, a person who's been my teacher, uh, founder in the field of criminology, and our distinguished uh, researcher of Rutgers University for this year, Ronald V. Clark. Ron Clark.
Well, thank you very much, Todd. It's, it's wonderful to hear such nice things being said about you by your boss. Um, the, um, and also, thank you all for coming out on this rather chilly day. Um, I hope that we will um, warm up a little as we carry on through this talk because I'll be talking about uh, uh, much warmer places like Africa and India and uh, South America. Um, now, uh, oops, trying to get it thing to move. You need to do, let's see, do this right here, click there, and now I think you should be able to. Now? Yeah. Good. Cool. See, he can do everything. Um, so, um, I'm going to talk, as you saw, the title of my talk is Conservation uh, and Criminology forget the rest of it. Um, and uh, at first sight, uh, these two words don't seem to go together very well. Um, and very little, uh, very little work has been done by criminologists on conservation. But actually, uh, as Todd has uh, said, the, the uh, species that we, that we will talk about today, many of them are, are quite highly endangered as a result of poaching. And poaching um, is, a, is uh, the illegal taking of plants or animals from the wild or from private property. Uh, it is a form of theft. And criminology is defined as the study of crime and society's response to crime. So it actually falls very well into the, into the subject matter of criminology, even if criminology hasn't had much to do with conservation over the years. Um, my talk uh, will cover research on poaching that uh, I've undertaken with students at this School of Criminal Justice, graduate students, that is. Um, I will talk about the, Todd's all, already mentioned that there's a, a novel criminology underlying this approach, and I shall expand a little bit on that. Um, and then I will um, give details of four studies that uh, uh, I've undertaken, which is just uh, only some of the studies that we have undertaken now. Can you hear me all right, or is this? Uh, you can't. What's happened here then? You keep talking. Try that. Is that better? Yeah. OK, good. Uh, I'm glad some of you are holding up your hands to your ears. Um, the, the four studies I'm going to talk about, which are just some of the studies we've done, uh, one is on illegal uh, commercial fishing, uh, one is on um, poaching of tigers, poaching of leopards, uh, no, sorry, not leopards. Uh, we won't talk about that. We'll talk about uh, com uh, poaching of um, commercial fishing, um, poaching of parrots, and Tiger poaching, that's what we're going to talk about. Um, now, most of these, most of the problems of endangered, poaching of endangered species takes, takes place overseas in, in, in Africa, Asia, South America. There's not much ca is done in, in, in America. Um, so that's why we, this is all about o overseas. And then I will uh, talk a little bit about directions of future research. Directions of future research. No? Can you hear me? Needs to be turned up a bit. They're working on it. All right. I'll try and talk a lot louder, um, which won't be that easy for me. But anyway, let me try. Now, I'm going to begin uh, with the... Um, criminology that under, underpins this approach, but don't worry, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I know that theoretical work is of pretty limited interest to people except in that particular field, but I'll just give you a flavor of, uh, the, um, uh, of the theory. Um, now, standard criminology, uh, the people who've been involved in that, most criminologists, have not been interested in wildlife crime. I think our program is really one of the first in the world that has begun to look at wildlife crime. 
Um, they've, most criminologists, are quite rightly in a sense, have been preoccupied with crime in the streets and in deprived neighborhoods. Um, and most criminological theories uh, try to explain why some people, some young people, become criminally inclined. That's really what most of the discipline has been about for many, many years. Um, the, the theories they develop, dispositional theories, focus on the factors in the uh, makeup or backgrounds of the, uh, of the uh, young offenders and people who later become criminals. Um, now, I believe they importantly neglect, I know they importantly neglect, um, offender decision-making. They treat the offender as somebody who doesn't have much going on in his mind. He's been pushed into crime by his background and his makeup. Um, and they ignore what's going on in, in, in the offender's mind. Now, I think, that's a, I think that's a bad mistake because we are all of us thinking all the time about what we do and what decisions and choices we make. And the same applies to criminals. Um, so these uh, crim standard criminology has uh, neglected what we call offender decision making and how situational variables, that's uh, environmental variables, uh, help determine this process. Um, that's what standard criminology has tended to do. Now environmental criminology, which is the new approach that Todd referred to, it's not so new any any longer, I'm afraid, but it was new. Um, sometimes it's called crime science. People are beginning to call it crime science. Has developed uh, several new theories to explain the interaction between uh, a criminal disposition, something that pushes people towards crime from within themselves, and crime opportunities that give rise to the expression of that uh, crime. Of, the, of that criminal tendency. Um, now, I'm not going to go through these in any, any, any detail, but I just want to mention what sort of things these theories cover. The first one, routine activity theory, um, that looks at how crime opportunities rise and fall in society with, with changes in society. Now, a very good example of that, which we're all familiar with, is the Internet. Um, 15, maybe 20 years ago, I don't know quite how long, uh, the Internet was not something one thought about when one was thinking about crime. But now it, is a, it, is, uh, it, it provides the opportunities for a vast range of crimes, difficult ones to deal with. Um, so that's a completely new environment which was caused by social change. That's the kind of thing that uh, routine activity theory is interested in, in charting how these changes produce uh, brand new opportunities for crime that we've got to think about. Uh, crime pattern theory, the next one, thinks about or deals with how offenders find crime opportunities. This is typically a neighborhood perspective, so how does a criminal living in a neighborhood go about finding finding crime opportunities. That's what this theory de deals with. It's different from the first one. Uh, the, the last theory, rational choice theory, that deals with the actual decision-making process that offenders go through uh, when they are faced with an opportunity to um, uh, commit a crime or when they're looking for an opportunity to commit a crime. How do they make the decision to actually do it? That's the third theory. Now, the theories, as you've seen, do deal in different aspects. They're not um, in competition, but they're, they're, they're in fact complementary. Uh, nobody's ever yet put them all together, but probably somebody will one day and make a grand theory of all of these things. Um, the point about these theories for us today is that they underpin the practical approach that, uh, of situational crime prevention which guides the work that I'm going to be telling you about. Um, it guides the work that we've been doing on wildlife crime. It, uh, situational prevention does not seek to change individuals at all. 
it doesn't try to change the offenders. What it tries to do is to reduce opportunities for crime. Now, in a sense, that changes offenders because they uh, have fewer opportunities, we hope, to uh, commit crimes. But it's working on the situations that produce the crime opportunities rather than on the people who commit the crime. Um, that's that's the, uh, an important distinction. Um, now, this, this approach has been adopted by, uh, against many different kinds of crimes to prevent them, and there's many successful applications. When I say successful, I mean that they've been evaluated uh, statistically to see whether there are improvements in the problem once these measures are introduced. And uh, there's actually something like around 250 published studies that have, have uh, documented uh, situational crime prevention. Not all of it's successful, but, it, but a lot of it's successful. Um, situational prevention, just give you a little bit more theory and then we'll start talking about the animals. Situational prevention assumes that um, opportunity plays an important part in every form of crime, no exceptions. It isn't just opportunistic crime we're talking about, that is someone putting their hand into the, through a back window of a car and snatching a camera, which is an opportunistic crime. Obviously opportunity plays a role in that, but we're talking about any kind of crime has opportunities built into it, even let, let's say like bank, bank robbery. The way that banks are set up, the way that they're run, their security, um, their security precautions are all part of the opportunity structure for that kind of crime. If you made it a lot easier, if you reduced some of these opportunities, if you, if you took away some of this security, you would certainly get more bank robberies than we have right now. Um, so that's, that's a very important point. Next important point is that um, people decide to use these opportunities. They make a decision and a choice to use these opportunities to benefit themselves. Uh, not always financially. A lot of it is financial benefit, as we shall see in, in uh, the case studies I will talk about. But also for a host of other reasons, like sexual pleasure, revenge, prestige, dominance. Every single uh, human uh, motive is covered by this idea that people do these crimes to benefit themselves. Um, now, that wasn't a very popular idea with, among criminologists because criminologists are generally, I hope I'm not, uh, not being too simplistic here, but generally uh, criminologists are somewhat on the side of the offender. Um, and so they don't really like to hear people saying that actually offenders choose to commit crime um, because the next step is, well, then you should punish them for it. Actually, I don't actually believe in that because m much research has shown that uh, punishment doesn't work very well. Um, you can't modify people's behaviors very well by punishment. Uh, in fact, criminals are much more, they're less worried about the punishments they, they might receive than, than about the fact of getting caught. Uh, so when they set out upon a crime, they're often thinking, well, I won't get caught. They're, they're not really thinking that. They're thinking, how can I avoid it? How can I avoid getting caught? They're not thinking about what will happen if they are caught. That seems odd to us, but it's, it's, it's been shown in many studies. Actually, I've got a little anecdote about that. Um, I've got a, a friend who spends quite a bit of time interviewing serious criminals in prison. And one day he was interviewing one of these guys who was a... Uh, who committed many, many serious robberies. And he said to him, in part of his interview, he said to him, uh, uh, did you think you would get caught? And the, uh, the, the, the criminal leaned back in his chair and said, I never thought to hear a criminologist ask such a stupid question. <laughs> of course I didn't think I'd get caught. I wouldn't have done it if I thought I'd get caught. 
So um, that shows what they are, what's going through their minds. Um, now, um, the next point about situational crime prevention is it, it, is it assumes that people, that their decisions to commit crime can be altered by changing the situation. There's quite a lot of evidence of this now. Um, but um, uh, you, the, the, the situation consists of physical situation and social situation. If you can find ways of changing those, you, um, you're changing the opportunity structure for those crimes and they're less likely to happen. That's the theory and in fact it does work. Uh, last point is that dispositions, that is what's, what people are born with or brought up with, etc. Dispositions and opportunities might be equally important in causing crime. I think they are. I think they're equally important and I don't think you can separate them really. However, it's much easier to change opportunities and reduce opportunities than it is to change people. So that's why uh, this approach is one I've been following of, of, uh, because I think it's much more effective. Um, and the other thing is that the results are much more immediate. If you remove the opportunities for a specific kind of crime, you have an immediate effect. You see this in the evaluations. The crime is bumbling along at this level. You introduce some, some changes and you see a drop immediately. Now, if you're trying to prevent crime by changing people's dispositions, it's a very long time before you'd ever see a result, if it ever came. I'm not sure that you can do it very effectively, but even if you could, it'll be quite some time before these changes that you've made to the way people are brought up and, and their personality and so on show up in reduced crime. So there's a very distinct advantage there for situational prevention. Okay, now if you're going to do this stuff, what do you have to do? First of all, you've got to focus on very specific categories of crime. Criminal decision making is situation dependent and that means that um, you have to focus on very specific kinds of crimes if you're going to understand the situation and the decision making. Um, poaching is much too broad. Uh, even tiger poaching would be too broad. Poaching tigers from Indian tiger reserves would probably be sufficiently crime specific, probably. Um, some people might argue, well, you've actually got to get down to a specific reserve, but anyway. Um, so you've got to focus on a very specific category of crime. Then you've got to study the modus operandi. How was it done? How are these crimes done? Uh, you've got to do it step by step because crimes are not over in a flash. They're, they're drawn out actions. They, the, the, the offender has to, let's just say, select a particular target, has to think about how to approach it, has to, uh, has to try to take it, um, has to carry it away, has to do something with it when it's carried. It's, it's a long process. And to be effective in prevention, you've got to understand the facilitate, what we call the facilitating conditions at each of these points. Um, and when you do that, you, you, at the end of your analysis, you will reveal what we call pinch points um, where prevention might be focused. Where is the best place to put your preventive effort? Because prevention is a very expensive resource and you've got to not waste it. So you find, try to find out where is the best place to put your, your effort. Okay, now I'm gonna to get to some of these uh, uh, animal studies. Um, first of all, uh, I want to talk about a study that I did with Goha Petrosian. I don't know whether she's here, she might be. Um, Goha Petrosian, who's now an assistant professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. This study was published last week in the British Journal of Criminology, so this is really up to the date information. A uh, bit of background, about one third of all fish taken from the seas 
are taken illegally. Um, so it's a very big problem. Um, it is a form of theft because uh, it, uh, you know, these, these fish don't belong to the people who are taking them. They're taking them to make a profit. Um, it's also a uh, harmful crime because it often uses destructive fishing methods that harm the marine ecosystem. It undermines the economy of poor countries that depend on fishing. It can devastate coastal communities particularly that rely on fishing for employment and for survival. So it's a very harmful crime. Uh, and in the, long, in the long run, it's depleting the ocean of uh, very valuable resources. Now, the assumption behind our study was that knowing uh, which species are targeted by illegal fishes will provide insight into their motives, their perceptions of enforcement, the methods they employ, the routes taken to offload their catch, patterns of consumer demand, etc. So it is very important to try to understand which fish are, are illegally fished. Now, you can't actually find a list of those in the literature, not until we've just published this article, where we uh, identify 58 species that are illegally fished. We, um, how we did this, we scoured the literature and uh, web sources to identify fishes and we had various criteria of, of identification, fishes that uh, were reported to be illegally fished. Um, now, uh, if you ask the average person, they would probably know a little bit about this. I mean, you probably all know that um, uh, sturgeon uh, uh, are fished because of, illegally fished because of their, of their uh, roe, which is caviar. And um, you probably might know that bluefin tuna are a uh, very, uh, are, are a fish sought by illegal fishers. But nobody until our study has actually made a list of these and tried to show that it's, it's a reasonably reliable list. Having done that, we matched those 58 illegally caught species individually, each fish individually, with 50, uh, each fish, we had a control for each fish that was uh, chosen using a standard classification of fish. In other words, we tried to make the control as closely similar to the uh, illegally fish fish as the, um, uh, make, make the two groups very similar, we tried. Uh, then we compared them on a, on, on a standard me, um, model of theft, which is called CRAVED. And that stands for concealable, removable, available, valuable, enjoyable, and disposable. That's CRAVED. It's an acronym. And these are supposed to be the key, um, the key attributes of objects that are stolen. Now that might seem a funny thing to be doing, but when you think about it, um, actually most property is never stolen. Uh, the chairs you're sitting on, they're not going to be stolen, at least uh, highly unlikely. This poster's not going to be stolen. What's going to be stolen is your cell phone, uh, your computer, uh, maybe your car, uh, maybe some electronic gadgets that you have. That's what's going to be stolen. Those are what are called hot products. The great majority of stuff that we have is never stolen. Um, so we are necessarily worry about things being stolen that never would be. So uh, it's a good idea to figure out what it is that makes objects more likely to be stolen. And that's what the Crave model is supposed to do it's been found fairly successful and useful in identifying what kinds of things are stolen. And we're now finding it useful in the wildlife sphere as well. 
So what happened when we did this? Well, we found that um, uh, it, it, the illegally taken fish were more concealable. That is, they were sold through uh, more ports of convenience, what are called ports of convenience, where the controls are very limited. Uh, they were removable. That's caught with a long liner. A long line fishing vessel is often involved in uh, illegal fishing. It's the most common vessel that takes part in illegal fishing. Um, the fish uh, tend to be abundant or accessible. In we use those instead of available. Uh, they tend to be valuable. That is, they're larger than the average fish. Um, they're enjoyable. We measured this by how often they, we could find them used in recipes. Um, and they are disposable, that is highly commercial. commercial. So we had different measures of these uh, attributes and we found that there were very large significant differences between the fish that was, were illegally fished and other fish. Um, what do we conclude from this? Well. I'm going to talk a bit more about this later, but our recommendations were fisheries authorities should focus on ports of convenience. They're, they're clearly uh, making this crime easier. They should closely monitor long liners. They should exert pressure on the 22 illegal fishing countries that we identified. Um, there are some countries much more likely to be involved in this than, than other countries. And we should educate consumers about vulnerable species. Some of this is already done, um, but we had more ideas about how you would warn people that they were eating uh, fish that was uh, threatened or endangered. Okay, so that's one study. Next study is uh, to do with the endangerment of parrots. We've done quite a lot of studies on parrots. Um, this one uh, was done mostly with Rolf Debye from Twente University in Holland, but uh, Stephen Pyries here in the picture uh, was a graduate student who's worked a lot with me on parrot poaching. He's now an assistant professor at Florida International University. Okay. Before the import of uh, wild birds was banned in the States through the Wild Bird Conservation Act in 1992, 50 to 150,000 parrots per year were in the 1980s were brought to the US from the forests of Central and South America, the, the neotropics. Um, why? Well, they are endearing and beautiful pets. Uh, people like having them as pets, and they could be sold for quite large sums of money in the U.S. Um, they're now one of the most endangered species of birds on the planet. Uh, the research question that we examined is, is this the result of poaching or habitat loss? Most conservationists focus on habitat loss, not so much on poaching. Uh, what, uh, there's some endearing and beautiful parrots. Um, what we did, we, uh, we again did a sort of matching study. We individually matched 146 neotropical parrots of different species with 146 control species, that is other birds from the same habitats. The control that we selected for each parrot was the species whose range, that is where it's generally found, was most similar to that of the parrot. We compared the parrots and the controls to find out the results on the authoritative IUCN red list of endangered species. The IUCN keeps a list of endangered species of every kind. Um, since the groups were matched for range, that is where they were found, and thus by proxy for habitat loss, any differences in the red list status, we argued, could be attributed to poaching. That, that's the essentials of the study. Um, these were the control species. Uh, some of them don't look very much like parrots, but um, 
they're taxonomically close, you know, the, there's tax, taxonomies of birds, and these birds tended to be fairly close to uh, the parrots. They're all mid-sized forest-dwelling birds, like, like most parrots. And they use holes and cavities for breeding, roosting, which is what parrots do. They, they find a hole and then they, that's their nesting site. And all these birds did the same. So uh, let's, let's just show you how we matched for the range. This is a, a matching for the painted parakeet, which is up here in the uh, left-hand corner. It was overlaid with two, ca we found two controls that were relatively okay. Uh, one, the Amazonian pygmy owl. Um, by the way, Rolf Debye is a very big expert on birds, much, much, knows much, much more about them than I do. And the uh, Guian and Tucanet, these were the two. So let's just show you. The painted parakeet range is that yellowy one. The uh, um, Amazonian pygmy owl, the range in South America is the blue. Then uh, here we are again with the range of the painted parakeet. This was the range of the Guian and Tucanet. So you can see that they did overlap in both cases, but the range for the Amazonian pygmy owl was a much closer fit. So that was the one that we, we selected as a control. Okay, now what was the results? Here's the results. Um, the thing to look at in this table is the first four rows, they're in red. Uh, there's 146 birds in each of these groups, the parrots and the controls. But if you look at critically endangered, there's seven parrots and two controls. Endangered, 15 against three. Vulnerable, 25 against three. Uh, near threatened, 14 against five. And least concern, of course, more of the controls. So, what do, well, let me just mention a couple of limitations before I go on to what we concluded. The first is that um, some of these controls are actually rather different from parrots in some ways. For example, potoos and owls are nocturnal, and woodpeckers create their own cavities, whereas parrots can't do that. But when we took those, those uh, less good controls away from the, the uh, study, the results stayed, uh, well, it made very little difference to the results. We still had the same kind of results. Uh, and as you saw, the ranges for the parrots and the controls do not always closely match. But when we removed the 50% of matched pairs with the lowest overlap of ranges, uh, this made the overall pattern of results even stronger for reasons we don't understand. But anyway, it didn't weaken the results, which would have been a pity if they had. So, what do we find? Nearly five times as many parrots as uh, the controls are endangered. In 50 out of, 58 out of 68, 65 pairs with unequal red list status, the parrot is at greater risk of extinction. We concluded that poaching is a strong cause of endangerment of parrots. It may be even stronger than habitat loss. Uh, many parrot species adapt readily to changing habitats, and we think conservationists should now pay much more attention to poaching than they've done in the past. Um, we found in other studies of parrots that um, the ban on importing wild birds to the US stopped the export of parrots to the US, but it did not reduce poaching. Just as much poaching went on before as uh, uh, after as before. Um, the poachers simply sold the birds domestically. There's quite a strong market for in, in these countries for, for, for parrots. I think about, I think it's something like about a third of homes in many of these countries have a parrot. So there's a lot of people would like a parrot. They're like dogs and cats for us. Um, so there's a strong uh, market for them, and they're mostly sold on illegal street markets. 
um, which again I will return to later on. All right, uh, elephants. Um, this is a, a study that um, that uh, uh, this hairy person here, who's a, a former student, uh, Andrew Lemieux. Uh, Andrew Lemieux and I did a few years ago. Uh, he's now a postdoc fellow in uh, a Dutch research institute. Okay, this is the background, and it's a bit eerily similar to what we're seeing now, actually. In 1979, about 1.3 million elephants roamed Africa. But 10 years later, this number had dropped to that amount. Is, is it about half? Anyway, it's, it's a big drop in 10 years. In 1969, a CITES ban on the international trade in ivory was agreed. CITES is a, the convention for uh, something to do with international trade of endangered species. I can't remember the exact uh, title of this uh, organization. But they govern the trade in endangered species worldwide, and, and nearly every country uh, belongs to that uh, convention. Um, and after quite a lot of politicking, they agreed to uh, put uh, the elephant on the endangered list, meaning that you couldn't uh, trade the ivory from an elephant uh, internationally. Okay? Um, to draw attention to the ban, Richard Leakey at the Kenya Wildlife Service, who came here last semester and gave a talk, which was very enlightening, uh, burned tusks seized from poachers and collected from dead elephants. And these images were seen uh, by millions of per people worldwide. In terms of situational prevention, there's 25 techniques of situational prevention. This particular de technique would be called uh, disrupting the market. You are disrupting the market for this particular, um, for, for ivory. Uh, so here he is. He's now a professor at uh, Stony Brook. And this is the ivory that he burned uh, in 1989. He did it to draw attention to the passing of the CITES ban and to the plight of elephants. It was seen by millions of people. It was a very powerful image. So, OK, the ban was enacted. Richard Leakey followed it up with burning tusks. What, what was the overall effect? Um, which of the 37 uh, sub-Saharan countries with elephants benefited most from the ban? We didn't, we, you wouldn't expect the ban to be a, of equal um, strength in every country. Um, and we set about trying to explain what explains the variation in benefits. And we looked at three particular uh, things. We looked at civil conflict. You know, there's an awful lot of conflict going on in, in, in Africa nearly all of the time. Um, corruption. And finally, unregulated uh, domestic markets, which, if you remember, I mentioned in relation to parrots. Um, well, what did we find? We found that... Uh, um, Some countries benefited greatly from the ban, and I've got them here on the left, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Namibia, Kenya, Botswana. Other countries continued to lose elephants in quite large numbers, so the ban didn't help them at all. Um, overall, it improved the status of elephants in, in Africa. Uh, it rose in the 18 years after the ban from uh, 625,000 to 730,000. So there was a distinct improvement as a result of the ban, but it, it varied from country to country. Uh, and why was that? Well, the ban did not apply to the domestic trade in, in, in ivory. In other words, you could still sell ivory within the country that it was uh, poached. Um, and countries with unregulated domestic markets 
were more likely to lose elephants during the post-ban period than other countries. 75% uh, of all elephants that were lost were from five countries, all of which bordered three or more countries with unregulated ivory markets. So that seemed to us to be the villain of the piece, the fact that you could still sell these, this ivory domestically. Corruption and civil war, war were also important, but not as important as uh, unregulated markets. Um, and unregulated markets allow poachers to sell ivory at a price that would justify the risk and effort of obtaining it. Now, funnily, well not funnily enough, tragically enough, ivory poaching has emerged again as a serious problem, but it's morphed into something somewhat different. And this happens with crime a lot, that you deal with one manifestation of crime and it changes and you've then got to deal with that one all over again. Um, what's happening now, apparently, is that whereas before the poaching was a, a kind of cottage industry by poor peasants uh, who then sold the tusks on to dealers, what's happening now is that there seem to be, I, I don't know this for a fact, but Hillary Clinton was on the TV this morning saying it, uh, there seems to be... Um, heavily armed gangs from other countries like where they have uh, you know the Janjaweed and places like that, that that have those kind of groups are poaching uh, elephants and selling the ivory to, to China which is a uh, which is now becoming much more wealthy and able to afford this ivory it sells for roughly about a thousand dollars a pound so it's very valuable um, and uh, according to a, a CBS story this morning, which Janice uh, Friedland kindly forwarded to me, um, the, uh, the U.S. is going to, today, is going to crush six tons of illegal ivory to draw attention to the problem. So it's doing what Leakey did, in different, they're not, they're not burning it, they're crushing it uh, with a stone crusher. Um, to just draw attention to uh, this serious problem and in the hope that other countries will, will uh, take action to deal with the poachers and this uh, illegal trade. Okay, right, this is the last one. This is about tiger poaching. How am I getting on for time? Ooh, I've got on too long, but can I run through this fairly quickly? Um, Okay, this, I, I worked on this one with Dr. Kevin Shetty from the University College London and uh, Mangai Natarajan, who is a professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. She's here somewhere. There she is. Um, when she, uh, m a long time ago, she's now a big shot at John Jay. Um, she worked with me on this when she was at John Jay, but she was a student here in, in the school a long time ago. Not I'm not going to say how long ago. All right, the problem. Um, most of the tigers in India are now in tiger reserves, most of them. And there's only about 1,450 tigers left in India, which is down from 100,000 in 1900. So they've really been decimated. Um, as I said, most are in you, these red places. Do, uh, triangles are where the tiger reserves are. They're scattered all over India. There's 37 of them now. Uh, I want to begin with a story, a conservation disaster. In 2009, it was discovered that no tigers remained in two famous tiger reserves. Uh, Panna, uh, it had 31 tigers in 2002, 2009 none. Uh, Sariska, had 22 tigers in 2002. A government report identified two principal causes. Poaching, a tiger carcass in, in uh, China is worth $50,000 roughly. Oh. They use it for traditional Chinese medicines. Um, and then second cause is retaliatory killings of tigers by, by villagers for, for livestock depredation. So 
around these reserves there's lots of villages, they have cattle, they let them wander around. Uh, the tigers come out and, and eat the cattle and uh, then the, the villagers get very angry of course and they wait up for the tiger to come back to finish off the, off the uh, meal because the tiger can't eat a cattle in one, uh, can't eat a cow in one go and uh, then they shoot it or else they, um, they uh, poison the carcass so that the tiger gets poisoned by eating the remainder of the carcass so this is common um, and those are the two main causes of this uh, uh, disaster in these two tiger reserves. Okay, the, the underlying problem is that local people, local villagers resent the tiger reserves. They don't see any benefit from them. Uh, the tigers kill their livestock and sometimes people and that's not uncommon at all. It happened in one reserve that, uh, that we visited in our course of our research. The same day we were there, a tiger killed somebody. Um, the people are prevented from, res from entering the reserves to hunt, graze cattle, gather firewood, and gather honey. And the locals feel generally that the government favors tigers over them. That's the, that's the prevailing view among these villagers who are near these uh, near these reserves. And these resentments are often fanned by local politicians for their own purposes. Um, the research question we, we uh, examined in this study was could tiger tourism provide a solution to tiger poaching? That's what we were focused on. Uh, tourism can obviously bring many benefits to local people, employment and improved local infrastructure. But at the present time, only 10 out of 37 reserves have substantial populations of tourists who hope to see a tiger. Now, the big problem with tiger tourism is that most people who go into these reserves hoping to see a tiger never see one. It's not like Africa, where if you go out on a safari, you're almost guaranteed sight of elephants, of cheetahs, lions, all of the big animals that you expect to find. In the Indian tiger reserves, you hardly ever see a tiger. Uh, we went round, I think it was five or six reserves in, in privileged access with uh, forestry officers um, uh, driving us around. We only saw two. Um, now, why is that? It's because there's dense forest cover in many of these uh, reserves and it's not so easy to spot them even when they're really quite close by. And the other thing is that tigers tend to be mostly active for short periods of the day around sunset and sunrise. So you've got a fairly small window when the tourists could see them. Okay, so what did we, what did we suggest? We suggested deploying closed circuit television, uh, which could transmit uh, images of tigers in real time to the visitor center and to nearby lodges. Now, this isn't quite the same as seeing a tiger, but it's a lot better than seeing nothing at all. Um, and we thought this might, might be worth a try. Uh, but it had a lot of problems. I mean, the benefits, you could stream images of the tigers on the internet and could promote tourism that way and attract foreign donors, one would hope. Cameras could direct tourist jeeps to the tiger sightings with savings in petrol and uh, gas, I should say, and harmful emissions. Um, cameras could monitor the behavior of tourist jeeps. They're sometimes not well behaved, uh, as we observed. Um, and they could spot poachers as well. Uh, they could use code recognition software to reliably count tigers and therefore reward ranges for annual increases in tiger numbers. So we had a lot of benefits that we were selling with this CCTV solution. The big question was could they be effectively used? Um, uh, given the terrain, could the cameras see the tigers? How many cameras would be needed? Does the technology exist to make this scheme work? Those are the, those are the things we had to answer. And we answered these questions by 
visiting five reserves to get a better idea of the terrain. Now that was really a hard bit of research, but anyway, it was a lot of fun. Um, now this is some of the terrain that we photographed. As you can see, it isn't actually all dense forest. Um, tigers going across here would be quite readily visible. Here's another picture. Here's another picture. And this was fairly typical of the, uh, of the terrain that we saw. I mean, there was dense forest, but there was also a lot of this mixed in with the dense forest. Um, oh, that's, a, that's one of the tiger's favorite meals, uh, a spotted deer or chittle. Um, OK, we concluded that in central India, at least, Forests are less dense, more scrub, and some grassland. And this favor, favors ambush killings by tigers, who must kill one spotted deer, like the picture you saw, a samba deer, which is rather larger, or an Indian bison, must kill one of those per week to survive. Uh, the ti this was in very interesting, the next f fact. Tigers move about the reserves on animal or man-made tracks. They're often on jeep tracks. That's where you often see them. And the reason for that is that it's easier to move around if you're on a track than if you're trying to push your way through a jungle. Uh, and also, you're much less likely to get thorns in the pads of your um, feet. And that's a very, uh, that's a hazard for, for tigers. All of this, to our, our mind, favored the use of cameras. The second question was, how many cameras would you need? We tried to answer that by looking at camera trap data. Camera traps are, well, here they are, camera. Uh, they take a picture of an animal that's walking past that camera uh, by day or by night. And we calculated um, how many tigers, we, we, we had blocks of data, how many tigers were seen, how many hours was the, uh, the, the, the camera operating for, and so forth. And we, we came to the conclusion that um, in an average uh, tiger reserve of about 400 square kilometers, uh, you would need about 100 carefully sighted cameras. This was rather rough, but it was you know, uh, reasonably reliable, we felt. And these could yield one tiger sighting per daylight hour and several times that number at night. We, we worked all that out. You can imagine how we did it. So if you assume, assume that tourists spend one hour in the reserve's visitor center and several hours in the lounge or dining rooms of nearby lodges, they would have a good chance of seeing a televised picture of a tiger in real time. That's what we concluded. Now, that might seem not wonderful, but it's a lot better than nothing. Um, third question. Is the technology adequate? And this is where we relied on Kevin Shetty. Uh, he had to consider the CCTV cameras. He had to consider power for the system. He had to consider the data network, which the uh, pictures would be transmitted across. And he had to pr consider protecting the system from um, human attack and from weather. Now, I'm not going to go through all the details of what he found or what he concluded, but he basically said, this could work. Technology can deliver this solution. The remaining questions. Would the experience of seeing tigers on TV screens in real time be exciting enough to attract tourists? Well, we don't know. We think so, but we don't know. How costly? Who would pay for the cameras and associated tourist enhan enhancements? You can't just have the cameras, you'd have to have all kinds of, if you were going to s transmit it to the nearby lodges where people were staying, you'd have to consider that infrastructure. The other thing is tiger reserves, it's really strange, but tiger reserves in India are very politically sensitive. Um, would the Indian government be supportive? They haven't been particularly supportive of foreigners coming in s trying to solve the problem. For, for, for obvious reasons, but could we persuade them that this could work? And how could local people and politicians be persuaded? Could a pilot study be mounted? That's the next big question. 
We haven't mounted one, but that's what needs to be done, and we have specified what would be the requirements for a pilot study. Oh, this is one of the tigers we saw. I said we saw two. Uh, that's the end of the stuff about tigers. Uh, okay, let me just wrap up now. What have, what have been the achievements of, of this program? I think we've established wildlife crime as a valuable criminological field of study and an interesting one. We've managed to get studies published in top criminology journals, which we weren't sure we could before we began. The students, several of them, four of them at least, have obtained PhDs and good jobs in universities who've worked on this stuff. And most uh, important is they're continuing to do wildlife studies. So we hope there's a sort of uh, little centers developing around these, these students in different universities. What have we still got to do? Well, we must liaise better, much better, with uh, conservationists and biologists who've been doing work in this area of uh, not poaching but conservation for many, many years. I think we could greatly strengthen our studies if we work together with biologists and conservationists, and we're beginning to find ways of doing that now. I think we need to focus much more tightly on solutions. It's all very well to say the problem is um, uh, illegal markets in these countries, and you should do something about them, but what? How do you actually control those markets? I mean, this isn't criminology now, but it's an essential part of bringing a solution to these problems. So we need to focus much more tightly on what's needed for these solutions. And I think the last thing that we're actually starting to do, we need to uh, do more work in the field. You will have gathered that nearly everything we've done is statistical using available data. Very little field work has been done, but we've got uh, Will Morito, he's over there. Um, has been, uh, no, 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 he's not. <laughs> That's uh, Anthony Liberato. Will, Mar Will Marito, who graduated from our um, program last year, uh, has been observing ranger patrols in a nature reserve in Uganda. He's working with that guy with all the uh, hair. Um, and uh, that both of them have been doing studies of ranger patrols in, in Uganda. Uh, Anthony Liberato is there. And he's been undertaking difficult, and, and I don't, don't say this lightly, he's been undertaking difficult and dangerous studies of illegal pet markets in the Peruvian Amazon. So he's getting out into the field and collecting data. We need to do more of that work. Okay, thank you for listening. Yes, um, well, as I say, we haven't done much in the way of field work, but if you were doing field work, if you were doing field work, that's the kind of thing you would need to be looking at. How can you uh, engage local populations? Because nearly all of the writings in this field say you need to do that. You need to engage local populations. So our CCTV study was just one way of trying to pull local populations into the sol solution of the problem. But, you know, the thing that's so depressing about this field, um, it's a very interesting field, but what is depressing is how much work there is to do. There are dozens of studies that need doing. There's dozens of angles that one needs to pr uh, proceed on, but very, very little is now happening, at least on poaching. Um, 
So that's what I find depressing. I don't know when we're going to get a real handle on these problems, actually. Yes. I'm wondering, um, thousands of species are being destroyed every year. Yeah. Mostly as a result of global climate change and other things that are happening in the environment. And the, the sorts of cases that you're talking about represent, I would imagine, a very small a very small amount of, uh, of, of action against endangered species. Why do you think, it's curious that we think that we're sort of interested in, is it just that we fetishize these particular species so we, we're, we're more interested in uh, the, the whys and wherefores and the solutions? Because if you, if you look at it from sort of a, a, a broader perspective, this really represents a very, very small uh, amount Yes. Yes, I, I, I don't disagree with that um, at all. Uh, but I think there's a, a benefit in focusing on charismatic species because it helps to draw attention to the, uh, the problem. And that's actually what uh, donors like. You know, you, if, you, if you talk about some some, let's say, a leopard, leopard spotted toad, uh, which is endangered in Africa. Uh, people aren't so interested in giving money to protect that, whereas they are very interested in giving money to protect uh, cheetahs, and that may have a, uh, you know, a f effect on the, on the uh, ecosystem. So I think there's a lot to be said for focusing on these charismatic species. But you're right, there's many, many more problems. Would you say something of, uh, about the first part of that question, which is the relative impact of um, domain loss versus poaching in the, in the overall picture of uh, endangered species? Yes. Um, well, that was really what, our, what the study that I talked about on parrots was about. Um, I think that the... the, the the, the, there's been a change in the, in, in the problem. Um, it was very clear at one point that uh, habitat loss was really the problem with parrot, parrot uh, declines. I now think that we have, or well, those countries and the United States have taken some, uh, have taken some measures to protect them. But I think that poaching is now as big a problem as, as uh, habitat loss and maybe even bigger. Um, so I don't think you can, uh, you can't really ignore the poaching. It may be, it has been the poor cousin of, of this field. Um, and, you know, there are thousands of people, conservationists and biologists, who are working on habitat loss. There's very few people actually working on poaching. So I think maybe the balance isn't quite right at the moment. I think we have to have more poaching studies than we've, we've done so far. But uh, does that answer what you were talking about? So I, I, I know that there are, in, in a group like this, on a topic like this, there are many questions. And we'll have an opportunity to explore uh, some of them. Um, I just want to say a word about the, the award for Chancellor's Research Excellence. Um, this is an award that um, is given annually for exceptional scholarly work on a subject fundamental to, to our in, uh, a fundamental intellectual importance. Candidates are selected for their scholarly accomplishments, creativity, the impact of their research, and the appeal of their work to a broader audience. There is a committee founded by, established by the chancellor who considers applications uh, and nominations for this award. This year's committee was uh, Jennifer Arena, uh, Kyle Farmbury, Frank Jordan, Lele, Paul Sternberger, and Bonnie Vesey. Um, the winner receives five, a $5,000 research account and this plaque. And I'm very <laughs> delighted to present this year's plaque to Ron Clark. So, um, so I am, thank you very much for coming. On the other side of this wall is a, um, hang on, keep it. <laughs> I'm, changing my, I'm changing my name to Ron Clark. Um, on the other side of this wall is uh, some uh, uh, items of food and some fellowships. Please join us for the reception in uh, Ron Clark's honor.